He's got his own t-shirt. Anybody that gets the opportunity to represent Two Paws is tapping into some unlimited potential. Is this okay. his account or is it... This is his account. Okay. I was trying to build a character for him. Character's important. That's the most important thing. Well, Winston sings now. Sing. He sings. Well, Paws okay. talks to Jay-Z at night. <laughs> First, Natty invites herself to our lunch. Now she is pitching... Two paws like hardcore to where it's like beyond dance mom status. He's very well to do. He's got a lot of money. That's kind of his like whole theme. This is getting really intense and weird. Keep it going one more time. Natalia's gonna make some more Please have a seat. And yes, let's let's talk about Two Paws for a second. Did Two Paws get representation? Is Two Paws taking care two of Two Paws her? is taking over the world. Rightfully so. <laughs> he's he's a I'm very rich say. cat. <laughs> I was when you showed up, I was only mildly disappointed that Two Paws wasn't with you. I will say that much. It's, mildly. Just a little bit. Uh, he's so funny. He's such a funny cat. And people just it's so funny because like the other cats in my house are jealous of him. Really? And it's, that's another issue that we have to address, another story, another day, but um, it's, it's, I love animals, and I've always been a huge animal lover, and of course, you know, you, you see Brie and Nicole, and um, you guys know her as Nikki Bella, um, and they love their dogs. We, everybody, you know, feels like if you have a pet, it's like your pet is your kid. Well, Tupaz is my child, and, you know, he's my baby, so I'm happy that you guys love him, and he's got 136 thousand followers that is incredible yes let's applaud for this animal's followers because that is incredible <laughs> it's amazing well uh thank you two paws or not i'm very excited that you're here thank uh, you and, and congratulations uh not just on this show but on everything you got going on I, I know recently at wrestlemania you just set a world record for most amount of in-ring appearances at a wwe pay-per-view by a woman 40 right yes. 40 appearances round of applause <laughs> for breaking yet another record. Um, yeah, and actually, it's funny because I have such a loyal fan base that, you know, sometimes I miss those milestones, but my fans, they never let me forget about that kind of stuff. And it's just so humbling and, and flattering that they, they follow my career so closely and they're so loyal. And it just, it actually, I mean, even though I play a bad guy on TV, bad yeah. girl, um, I really just, I'm so grateful to them because they started with me on my journey in WWE and they, they're still with me and they keep track of all those milestones. And I'm actually, um, I have the most matches of any woman in WWE history. Wow, And yeah. period. Yes, absolutely. I mean, as, and as you guys will find as we go through a little bit of this and talk some more, because we are going to talk about Total Divas for sure, but there were so many things that I wanted to talk to you about, because as I said back in the green room, you are uh, objectively amazing, and you've done a lot of incredible things, and you've been a lot of firsts, and you've broken down a lot of doors and a lot of walls. I didn't realize you had the most matches. When you found out that information, how did that feel when you realized that number? Because, of course, I don't think you know that in the moment. You don't know that running out to the ring, do you? I just, I love what I do, and I, you know, I've worked with so many extraordinary people through the years, and... Again, it was one of my very loyal fans um, that let me know that. And they're, you know, like a lot of our fans, they're just, 
they're like wrestling historians and yeah. they follow WWE and they follow the, the industry so closely. And, and so, you know, some re research was put into it and it, it's, it was just like, wow, I can't believe that. And I've had the chance to work with so many brilliant women, women like Beth Phoenix, who I just inducted into WWE's <laughs> Hall of Fame last week. Very incredible. You know, you uh, looking at your history, you grew up, you have very much been surrounded by uh, this world and wrestling your, your entire life. It's in your blood, it's in your veins. Can you look back and pinpoint the earliest moment that you knew this wasn't only the family business, but this is what you were destined to do? Because with the things you've achieved, it's definitely not just something you love, it's clearly something like this is your destiny. You are, you are so good at it, and you've done so much so far so early in your career. So if you look back at the beginning, when did you realize, huh, this is my thing? Like, this is what I'm I was doing. born to body slam people. <laughs> and, and I'm really proud of that because, you know, I do believe in destiny, and I, I believe in following your dreams, and I'm so lucky and so blessed to be able to know what my passion is and to be able to chase it and to be able to live it because sometimes you know we all we all you know have different journeys in life and we you know life takes us in different directions and not everybody gets the privilege of living their dreams and and I just feel like because I get to do that it's just the biggest blessing and I get to be around wonderful people that share that and support me the WWE universe um, my coworkers the girls in in our our locker room you know my husband my family and it's, it's just so great, and I feel like, you know, with my family, my grandfather is a WWE Hall of Famer, Stu Hart. Yeah. My uncles are Brett the Hitman Hart, Owen Hart, the British Bulldogs, yeah. and, you know, I, it's like when you come from that line of greatness, my dad is a two-time WWE Tag Team Champion, Jim the Anvil Neidhart. Yeah. And... <laughs> There's, there are moments where I stop, I step back, and I take a look, and I go, wow, my family's love that shirt, by the way. That's awesome. <laughs> That's a picture of Brett and Owen. Um, but my family is just phenomenal, and so there, are, there have been moments where I just, this is my destiny, but I also felt like I had such big shoes to fill. Well, yeah, that was going to be one of my questions is, uh, it's a double-edged sword. You come from that kind of legacy, and it's you have access to this knowledge. It's in your blood. It's in your veins. It's in your family. But externally, there's a lot of pressure. There's these huge shoes. So I was going to ask, did you feel that pressure going in when you were starting, and do you still feel it? I felt that pressure so much, especially when I was first starting, because my dad didn't want me to be a wrestler. My dad... I mean, my dad didn't even want me to have a boyfriend. <laughs> and so my dad, dad. Yeah. And my dad, I think to this day, he's like, TJ is just a friend, right? Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, and there was always so much pressure because when you come from, when you come from a family that's blazed this amazing trail, um, I always felt like I had to be as good as all of them. And then I realized, um, there was a point in time when I realized that I don't want to be just like Bret Hart. Yeah or just like my dad, or just like my grandfather, Stu Hart. I wanna be natty, and I wanna blaze my own trail. And there's gonna be times I'm gonna fall down, but I gotta get back up, and I gotta keep going. And um, being a part of the WWE for a decade now has helped me so much in finding strength and courage to fall down, sometimes flat on my face, and get back up, brush myself off, and keep going. And I had this conversation with Charlotte Flair. Yeah. You guys know Charlotte Flair? Woo. Um, there you go. I was waiting for it. Charlotte is one of my closest friends in the WWE, but I do plan on tapping her out very soon. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when she was first coming up and she was in NXT, she, she, I don't think she even had a match yet, but I was at NXT and I was doing something on the show and she pulled me aside in the locker room. And actually, it's the first time I've ever shared this story, so you're getting an exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> um, Charlotte was very she was very emotional and she was very worried because she felt like she didn't fit in. And she said, Natty, I look at you and you just seem like you have it all figured out. And like, how do you get so, you know, how did you get so much confidence? She's like, I feel like everybody wants me to be great because my dad's Ric Flair. And she's like, I don't feel like I'm pretty enough or I'm skinny enough or I'm good enough. And I, I don't feel like I could ever be as good as my dad. And it was just this wonderful, raw, real moment with this girl that was just, just a girl. 
just a girl expressing worries. Like all of us are human. We all we laugh, we cry, we, we all share the same worries. And so I always remembered that talk that we had. And then Charlotte and I had a match at NXT TakeOver. And that match was a turning point for her and it was a turning point for me because it was very symbolic of helping someone believe in themselves. And from that point forward, Charlotte realized what I had realized years ago, that she doesn't want to be her dad, Ric Flair. She wants to be Charlotte Flair, and she's going to blaze her own trail, and she is going to be the best in the world. And that's what you need to believe in order to reach your dreams. That's uh, a great story. Yeah, you're right to applaud for that. That was a good move. That was, that's a fantastic story. Um, I think you've certainly, you have lived that. You have been blazing, continuing to blaze an incredible trail. And you did, congratulations. This is 10 years since you've signed with the WWE, yeah. is that right? Uh, going back one more time, because there is something I would be remiss if I did not ask about this. You were uh, the first, if not only female, to go through the Hart Family Dungeon, as yes. it's known. My God, what was that like? Well, tell us about that experience. That must have been crazy. Well, my grandfather had trained some of the greatest superstars in the history of the wrestling business. And so many great people have come out of the dungeon. And, um, you know, there weren't, <laughs> there was, there were all men. And so for me, I had the privilege of training with my family down in the dungeon. And uh, TJ Wilson, AKA Tyson Kidd, was really my first coach. And um, I think wrestling, I'm, I don't think, I know, wrestling is really what brought us together. And it's kind of what made me fall in love with TJ, even though I gave him a few black eyes practicing. <laughs> that's just love, though. That's just, that's what love is. When your first wrestling move is a Hurricane Rana, it's, wow. you're going to give somebody a black eye. But TJ took it all in stride, and he, you know, wrestling is really what brought us together. And I was so privileged to learn the dungeon because the dungeon made me so strong. And I realized that, you know, I needed to go through really hard times in order to... Um, understand how good it was going to be to reach my dreams in the WWE. I, I always knew I was going to make it to the WWE, but I just knew that I had to, I had to really persevere in so many other ways before I got here. But I, I always knew I was going to get here. I just, it was always in my heart. I just knew I would get here, even though I had the door slammed in my face, like, well, for a good five years. Hmm. Uh, not to not to labor the dungeon thing, but I'm I'm dreadfully curious. Is it what walk us through if you could, if you remember, like one of the hardest days in the dungeon? Was it super early and super late nights? Was it incredible workouts unlike anything you've ever done before? What was? Why did people call it the dungeon? It was a really small, dark, um, almost a damp room, and my, so a literal dungeon. Yes. Wow. <laughs> well, they called it the dungeon for a reason. And mm -hmm. my grandfather's house, the Hart House, uh, it's now a historical site in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, but the house was a hospital in the First World War. So there's four stories, and the dungeon was located near the crematorium of what we used to be a hospital. My grandfather's house was a hospital. So um, the dungeon was right next to the crematorium, and it was just this little room and there was only one window in the dungeon. And so there was very, you know, there was really no light that came into the room and it was just a mat. And, um, there was a hole in the ceiling where somebody's head had gone through the ceiling. Thank you, Owen Hart. Um, yeah. And, and my uncles, you know, were my uncle Owen was a high flyer. So he, um, he, he was all about, you know, just, he was, he was the more, um, agile one. So I think he had a match in there with uh, Dan Severin. And I'm sure you guys, have, you know, if you have the WWE Network, you can check it out. Um, but it was just this little room and, um, you know, sometimes our practices would be two, three hours. Sometimes they'd go for six hours. I remember when Dory Funk came to the dungeon and he came as a guest um, teacher. We were practicing until like two in the morning. I thought we were never going to go to bed. Um, but it was great because I got to share my passion with other people that, you know, love wrestling, um, like my husband. And, um, you know, even Chris Jericho has come from the dungeon. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of great names have so many, Monsoon. Gorilla Monsoon. Gorilla Monsoon, little known fact, he trained in the dungeon. Hmm. Um, Greg, the, Greg the Hammer Valentine. Wow. Jake the Snake Roberts. You know, people that, you know, little known facts. But, yeah, it's um, my grandfather trained some of the greatest pro wrestlers of all time. And I was just lucky enough to have the opportunity to train in there. And 
I still believe to this day, if you can survive the dungeon, you can survive anything. Hmm. Yeah, well, for, sounds like it, for sure. Let's, <laughs> we've got a couple of minutes in before we go to uh, audience q and I want to dig in on Divas and talk to you about the show. Uh, so far, uh, in the second half, two episodes that, that we've had a chance to see, uh, in the draft, there's a, a moment uh, where you're sort of hesitant to, to push you know, Nikki back into the ring and all these things, and you're, you're very cautious about that. And then last night, there was a moment uh, where you were talking about um, with Naomi, her intro, and very encouraging. Is this role of like looking out for your fellow superstars, something that, uh, that, is this a personal responsibility that you take on or something that you fell into naturally where you're sort of, do you all keep an eye out for each other that way? Because I see it a lot from you where you look out for everybody. I really, you know, despite the fact that, you know, in the WWE we're all competing and especially now that we have two brands with Raw and SmackDown Live, we've got two women's championships, we all really want to be the best. But at the end of the day, like, I really love the girls and I, I just... I want us all to grow together and I care a lot about the girls and nobody wants to get injured, you know, and, and that's the thing that Nikki, Bella and I, we, Nikki and Bree started in the WWE the same month that I did. So, you know, when I started in the WWE, I didn't, I didn't know anything about, you know, I feel like I didn't know anything about looking pretty or being feminine or, you know, what to wear. And Nikki and Brie helped me with that. Mm. And they really helped me find myself as far as how to dress and, you know, what kind of costume I was going to wear in the ring. And in return, I helped them learn how to wrestle. Yeah. And I take so much pride in that because I feel like Nikki and Brie are two of the greatest women wrestlers in WWE history, not just in the ring, but how they represent WWE and, and, um, and also in the stories that they tell from Brie Bella wrestling, Stephanie McMahon, to, gosh, the epic feud that I have with Nikki, yeah. you know, in our Falls Count Anywhere match, and just feel like they, they're both phenomenal in-ring competitors. But when Nikki got hurt, um, and then she was making her comeback, I'll be the first to admit, I was nervous about wrestling with her because I saw what she went through when she got injured. And I saw how much heartache and pain she was going through, and, you know, I saw her crying backstage when nobody else could see that. But Brie and I saw that, and we saw how much, you know, how much she was going through. So then when Nikki said that she wanted to come back, you know, we get it that she's fearless. <laughs> <laughs> but I just didn't want to be the one to hurt her again. And so that was, like, my biggest fear is, like, oh, I don't, I don't, Nikki wants to come back, and she wants to do this. But I just, I mean, I didn't want that on my conscience. So there was this point of contention between the two of us. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it comes from a good place. It wasn't like you were trying to hold her back. It was for her benefit. You like you didn't want to see her get re-injured or, or something more serious. And because I care about her as a person. Yeah, precisely. You know, because I, I just know how tough it can be. So yeah, yeah it was a, it was a really it was a really hard decision because there was a point where I was like literally about to talk to John Cena about it and be like, I don't want to be rude, but like I don't feel comfortable with this because I don't want Nicole to get hurt. And of course of course, we worked through it, and she was fine, and she actually did some of the best work of her career in her comeback. Um, but I learned a lot from it, too, just letting go and surrendering sure. to the universe. And you need friends like that, especially in your line of work, because I think the reason so many uh, superstars and so many athletes in your field achieve the things they do is because there is a part of their brain that tells them to keep pushing and keep going and keep doing this. You can do it. And if you don't have those friends from the outside to say, like, hey, I know you want to keep pushing, but maybe just, like, hang tight for a second and heal up a little bit more, it could be really serious. So, I, yeah. Trust me, I, I broke my ankle about a year ago, a year and a half ago, and I wanted to wrestle Sasha Banks so badly <laughs> that I was literally like, in my mind, in my crazy little natty head, <laughs> I was like, I don't care that I broke my ankle. I'm going to wrestle Sasha Banks. And then reality set in, and I was like, you know, I broke my ankle. I don't know if I can do this right now. <laughs> but um, I'm still waiting for that Sasha Banks match. I still want a piece of the boss. I think we would all enjoy that very much, yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question before we turn over to the audience. Uh, there's a lot going on in this season. What are some of the things you're excited for the fans to see in the upcoming episodes of Total Divas? What are some things that we got to look forward oh, to? Oh, this is a fun season. I mean, we have, you know, you guys have your old favorites, like myself and the Bella Twins and Naomi on the show. Um, I love Naomi. She's, like, one of my all-time favorite human beings. Um, she and... Uh, John Uso are so funny on the show, but you got these new cast members in Lana, and of course Lana comes with Rusev, <laughs> and anybody that can put up with Lana, bless her little heart, we all deserve a special medal, 
because I got a, I got a shot put th shown, uh, thrown through the windshield of my car. And I had, after Lana threw the shot put through the windshield of my car, she was literally on her hands and knees crying on my grass. And my neighbors haven't <laughs> talked to me since. Uh, <laughs> but um, that's, a, like, again, a story for another day. But um, you've got a uh, new cast member, Renee Young, and then her significant other, Dean Ambrose. Um, again, love both of them. And then you've got um, Maurice, and she comes along with The Miz. And I affectionately call Maurice my little French poodle because, you know, she's really like a poodle. And uh, it's, it's fun to have these new cast members because they just bring this surge of uh, energy and new life to the show. And, you know, we all have our moments because we're human. Yeah. And I, I love that on the show, like Lana's wedding. I mean, the girl wanted two weddings. She wanted 12 different dresses. And she comes up to me literally out of nowhere, and she's like, I, I fired my wedding planner. Well, gee, I wonder why, because you're Bridezilla. <laughs> and of course, I have to bite my tongue and go, oh, and? And she says, um, and I'm going to ask you to help me with my wedding because your wedding was so beautiful. Well, she was just looking at Instagram. I had seven people planning my wedding. <laughs> and she's like, I, I fired my wedding planner, and you're going to help me. And next thing you know, like, I'm trying to get fired from being her wedding planner. <laughs> <laughs> And that was our truth's fault, because our truth was telling me, like, listen, you need to get fired because nobody can handle this girl. But she wanted seven different flavors in one wedding cake. Is that, is that physically even possible? And I kept telling is her, Lana, possible? less is more. <laughs> less is more. And so there was just a lot of drama and tears. And I went to Bulgaria for her, her wedding, which you'll see in um, these upcoming episodes of Total Divas. And... I mean, I think Bridezilla is an understatement for Lana. I love her dearly, bless her heart, but she is just a, she's a bag of chips and a whole lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and with that note, let's go ahead and turn it over to the fans. I think I see a microphone right here in the front. You're your first question. Hi, Natty. Hi. I wanted to um, know from your earlier, you know, your earlier question, your answers, when you got the call to be Hill, like how hard is it or how fun is it to be the antagonist against your friends? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, first of all, what's your name? Cindy, and I love your shirt. Um, that's a great question, Cindy. I, you know, it was so, it was so weird being told that I was going to, I walked into work and at the time Lita was our producer and Lita, um, who I like, you know, idolize. She's one of my favorite women wrestlers of all time, Trish and Lita. And um, Lita says to me, you know, your character is taking a different direction and you're going to be a bad girl. And I think for me, just like a lot of us, like we get in our comfort zone of being a certain way. And it was just so easy for me to be good. You know, it's so easy for me to burst into tears at the drop of a dime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and Lana doesn't even have to be involved in that. Um, but it's just so easy for me to be to be liked and vulnerable. And, like, my comfort zone was being a good girl. And I was like, you know what, Natty? This is a great opportunity for you to step outside your comfort zone, try something different, and really just bite into the role. And it wasn't until I started competing against Nikki Bella that I really started to love being a bad girl on TV. And it was... And I credit Nikki Bella for really being that turning point in my career where um, our feud helped me immensely show everybody that no matter what you give Natty, I'm always going to make it gold. Whether I'm the champion, whether I'm the challenger, whether I'm good, whether I'm bad. And I always tell my husband, TJ, when I'm right, I'm right. And when I'm wrong, I'm still right. <laughs> uh, next question over here. Hey, Natalia, how you doing? Good. What's your name? Travis. Nice to meet you, Travis. Nice to meet you, Natalia. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, but I, I think you're like one of the like the best female performers like in the world right now. Like you've been the best for like years. Tell and me I've more. I always told my friends. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why is she not a champion? You know, so I was, I was just going crazy with that. But um, the question is that um, I'm a big like I'm I'm big on Bret Hart and Owen Hart and. You know, I just love watching their matches. I watch it over and over and over again. Uh, what was your favorite Owen match of all time? Ooh, I mean, uh, I think one of my favorite matches in general of all time was Bret Hart versus Owen Hart, WrestleMania 10. And that was actually in New York City. And um, it's funny because we talked about that. Beth Phoenix and I talked about that. It was a really big part of my speech and her speech when she accepted her induction to the WWE Hall of Fame. 
And it just, Beth said that, you know, when I first met Beth, and I talked about that in my speech, I first met Beth Phoenix. I didn't know who this girl was. I actually, I, I, I mean, I had no clue that she was, you know, her background or anything. And the first thing she said to me was, you know, I'm Beth and your family is the reason why I want to do this. I want to be a wrestler in the WWE. I want to be a superstar in the WWE. And she said, the match that made me want to be a superstar in the WWE was Bret Hart versus Owen Hart, WrestleMania 10. And to this day, and she said that in her speech, that those were, that was just this iconic moment for her because it was a really simple story of sibling rivalry. And there was a lot of truth to it too, that, you know, when you have a brother or sister that you're really close to, you, you know, have this incredible competition between each other, but a brother's love is stronger than anything in the world. So to this day, you know, my uncle Brett, his, his feud and his rivalry with Owen is something he just cherishes so much because it was this unbreakable special bond that they got to share in front of the entire world. And it still lives on in everyone's memory, you know, so I really appreciate your kind words about, you know, Bret Hart and Owen Hart. And that, that is probably one of my favorite matches. That's awesome. We do have uh, time for, I believe, one more question, and it is... Where's the microphone? Right over here. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Natalia. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, I know, you know, growing up in a prominent family, I just wanted to know, like, what kind of a legacy do you want to leave behind, you know, outside of uh, the family name? You guys are asking great questions. <laughs> um, I... I'm just so lucky that I have the opportunity to work in a company that has this global platform. WWE, we're in over 175 countries, and so while I get to live my dreams, you guys get to live them with me. And this entire time, you guys have been on the sidelines cheering me on. And it's just been this incredible journey where no matter what happens to me, whether, I, like I said, whether I'm the champion or the challenger, um, you know, whether I'm good or bad, you guys have been with me th this entire time. So for that, I'm incredibly grateful. But one of the best parts of being in the WWE and doing what I do isn't always what we do in the ring. It has a lot to do leaving my legacy, and I feel like this is really important. It's not just about wrestling. It's also about paying it forward. And in WWE, we do a lot of community outreach programs, a lot of work with the community, and we work with Make-A-Wish, we work with Special Olympics, we work with, um, you know... Connor's Cure, which is, you know, raising awareness for children's cancer and, and, and research, and um, Susan G. Komen, all these different groups, and um, I, really, I really love giving back. I love giving back to the girls I work with. I love giving back to my fans um, in the WWE, and I love giving back to people that are less fortunate than me, and I was just talking to somebody earlier today about, I met a little boy uh, about a year ago, his name is Chase, and he's 10 years old, and he has spinal cancer, and it's terminal. And um, Todd Chrisley of Chrisley Knows Best actually brought Chase to me and introduced all of the, the girls in the, in the locker room, introduced us to Chase. To this day, I still keep in touch with Chase. I send him videos. We talk. He's coming to see me in, in a couple weeks. And I feel like that is one of the greatest gifts I have in the WWE is to be able to use my influence in a job that I have so much fun doing and to be able to brighten Chase's day up because Chase doesn't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And he's a little boy that's fighting for his life. But if I can do one little thing that makes his day, that is my legacy. That is more important to me than being a champion because I'm changing somebody else's life. And I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't work in the WWE. So there's just this bigger picture. And for you guys, I'm so grateful that you guys help us do that because you guys are a big part of that too. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, regrettably, we're just about out of time, and I do have to let you go, even though we could do this for I could hours. talk to you guys yeah, for the next three hours. We could do this for the rest of the night, but we do have to say goodbye. I want to thank you, uh, not and congratulate you, not just on the show, but thank you for, for everything you've done in and outside of the ring. And, and on behalf of all the fans, I think I, I can speak for all of us and say that uh, in the world of WWE superstars, you are truly one of the greats. Uh, so, guys, please do remember, I know you already know this, but I'm going to tell you anyways, Total Divas, Wednesdays at 9. It's on E. Tune in and watch it. Anything else we should tell everybody about while you're here before we say goodbye? Quick question. Can I take this home? <laughs> <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Guys, one more time. Make noise for Natalia. Thanks, guys.